as a programmer, it is sometimes frustrating to work in a code base where there is uh, compile time errors because of missing dependencies, m missing uh, classes and, and libraries because a reference is there, but someone's forgotten to add the code in there. It's also frustrating to see a messed up config file. Hmm, annoying, right? But what is really, really frustrating is to see failing unit tests, just randomly failing unit tests. And I'm sure that if you went to the programmer who worked on the code base prior to you, their answer would be, it just worked fine on my machine. You know, I didn't do this purposely. And they wouldn't do it purposely, right? Who would leave um, code libraries hanging out uh, just because they wanted to? Um, but the problem here is because there is no unified um, machine where your code is validated ahead of you pulling it down, you run into these sort of conflict. Wouldn't it be great if there was like this neutral workspace where you could run the new increment of code before it gets added into the common source control repository? And, and it will help iron out most of these issues that you would otherwise run into. And that is exactly what continuation, continuous integration is. Continuous integration is a development practice that requires developers to integrate code into the shared library several times a day. Each commit is verified by an automated build, allowing teams to detect problems early. If we look at the workflow, you'd have some developers who would commit some code, and that code would get pushed into a source repository, and that would trigger an automated process on a server that is not a developer workstation. And on the CI server, you would have a build test workflow. Now, this is the bare minimum that you would have in a workflow. Of course, there is possibility to elaborate this as much as possible by running security scans, you know, code review scans, and whatnot. But this is the bare minimal that you need set up in your CI process. And then the results should be fed back to the developers who should then review the results and, and look at improving them. The question this brings is, is there continuous in your own integration? You know, a, um, a robust uh, continuous integration process depends on how robust you make it and how continuously you run it. Um, like continuous integration, like agile, like DevOps, these terms get used quite loosely these days. So you're never sure whether the continuous integration that you have set up in your organization is set up correctly, is reaping the benefits that you would expect it to reap. And so I'm gonna ask you five questions to help you validate whether the continuous integration process set up within your organization is set up correctly. The first question I want to ask you is, and keep your hand up if, if the answer is yes, is are developers in your organization committing code multiple times a day to the source control repository? Are the same developers committing at least once a day to the main code line that's used to publish the code into the test environment? If the answer is yes, then the next question is, are the, um, are the commits that are done triggering a process of automated build and unit test execution? And usually at this point, a lot of the hands drop, but if you're up for it, then the next question is, um, do the developers look at the results of the unit test execution? And a key metric there is code coverage. Are they constantly working towards improving the code coverage from these automated build processes? And if the, if the hand hasn't dropped yet, the last question is, when the build actually goes red and fails, do the development teams stop what they're doing and fix the build within the next 10 minutes? Now, if the answer to all of these questions was yes, well, then congratulations, you're doing continuous integration right. But if the answer was no, then I want you to take a minute and think about whether you're geared up to go the full mile into continuous delivery. It's because an organization that does not effectively make use of continuous integration, that does not uh, have a reliable and a stable CI process, will just not be able to go the full mile with CD and just be setting themselves up with frustration and failure. The, the three pillars of continuous integration are version control, our continuous integration system, and our automated build process. The first one, well, I mean, I've listed out some things there, but the version control systems are broadly divided into two categories. There's centralized and there's decentralized. And we'll talk about decentralized and centralized source control systems in a lot of detail in the next video. But for now, what I want to establish is that you need at least a version control system set up. There is no CI without a version control system. A continuous integration system like Visual Studio Team Services, like TeamCity, like Jenkins, and there are a lot more out there. 
but you need an automated way, uh, a framework that's able to capture the events of code commit and hence uh, at the back end of that trigger a CI process. And you know, you don't want to be writing bespoke systems yourself. There are a lot of them out there. Uh, some of them I've listed out. Some of them you can search for in, on, on the internet. Uh, the other thing we're talking about here is the automated build process. You know, uh, systems like Team Build. Team Build is, is an orchestrator that is capable of executing the tasks that you have within your CI process. Similarly, you have Ant, you have Nant, you have Gradle. But these are the key three things that you need in any sort of CI um, setup environment. Um, you know, throughout the course, we're, we're going to be talking a lot about OSS, open source, uh, you know, third party integration. Uh, but all of that would be within the focus of Visual Studio Team Services and the integration it has. As you can see on the screen now, you know, the cross-platform tooling that comes in with Visual Studio Team Services is what we're working with. Now within that, the component that we would be using for continuous integration and build automation is called Team Build. And Team Build not only allows us to set up continuous integration, it allows us to go the full mile by automating other components that need to be uh, automated and some that I want to call out that we will cover in a lot of detail as we progress further in the training is, you know, doing scans for technical debt, identifying technical debt within your code base, um, you know, decomposing your application into smaller packages and then consuming those packages um, uh, to, to break down the dependencies that you have because of a monolithical architecture. Um, you know, having an artifact uh, repository where you could store the outputs of your build and then use that for release management and, and deployment automation. And then looking at SQL package management whereby, you know, you, you can uh, on demand deploy SQL databases and uh, patch them and upgrade them uh, rather than managing scripts on the side. We'll, we'll look at a robust uh, mechanism that's provided. Um, web deploy that's uh, effectively used to deploy web-based solutions and last but not the least, test uh, automation using Selenium. Code doesn't exist unless it's, unless it's committed into source control. And as we're moving into this new era of uh, source, um, you know, code-driven concepts where, you know, database is treated like code, uh, infrastructure is treated like code, um, and today, security and process are even treated like code. Um, and if you don't have your code committed in a central repository, well, it's as good as saying that you don't have a single version of truth about your software that you're creating. Um, you know, just talking about the, the infrastructure as code, I would recommend that you go and check out the um, course that I've got up in the library in EDX that takes you into infrastructure as code and talks about how you can apply automation to get to the state of nirvana and, and have self-healing infrastructure in place. Um, an interesting trend that, that has come out uh, as I was, uh, you know, fiddling around with Google Trends is, um, you know, anything that's searched enough is probably being used enough. That's just, you know, just a hypothesis there. But, you know, if there's a technology out there and you're trying to implement it, well, you know, you might not find that it's working. So you're doing do a few Google searches to figure out how it works. Um, and, and so Google search uh, is, is recording all these uh, data points. And then when you go into Google Trends, you can pivot the search results over duration of time uh, by category. And in this case, the chart that I've created, I've done a, a pivot on a compare on centralized versus distributed source control systems for um, you know, computer um, um, and, and, um, and, and IT, IT as a business area. Uh, over the last uh, 10, 10 to 15 years. And you know, there's a very interesting trend that you see there where um, uh, uh, SVN, which is the centralized uh, source control system uh, showing up in green, was at its peak back in the days when Waterfall was the official process for delivery, right? Kind of makes sense because centralized version control systems are best suited for that model of delivery, whereas the distributed source control system, in this case, Git, starts to spike when Agile and Scrum came into being. And more so over the last five, seven years where open source has really taken the front seat. Now, you know, this is just uh, the, the trends off of Google, but uh, again, don't use that as the pure basis to make uh, the, the judgment on the distinction. I will talk through the, the data points so that you're better, better equipped to take that decision. Um, centralized source control system, 
in this case, I'm talking about team foundation version control, but you know, it's, it's similar to SVN. Um, the core strengths and, and the best use. But before we get there, the thing that if you haven't used centralized source control system is a centralized source control system has one server somewhere which acts as the central authority. And anyone who wants to pull code down from the central server needs to connect up to it. So as you connect up to it and download the code, you create a working copy that, of the code base that you're working on. Now you don't tend to download the full history, which means you've only got the last change that was committed for the file or for the bunch of files that you've downloaded. Which means if you wanted to, uh, you know, you would always need to be connected back to the server to get the latest and greatest back from the server. So the moment you go into the file to edit it, it sends a notification back to the server saying, you know, that I'm about to edit the file and it records that. So if someone else tries to edit the file, it will tell them that this file is already being edited by person X. And it's able to do that because every time you want to edit something, uh, you have to go back to the server and pull that information down. And in the process, the server records these key metrics, metrics for you. Um, now, what that establishes is that in a centralized source control system, you always need connectivity back to the server. Now, over the last few years, Team Foundation version control uh, released another type of workspace, which is called local workspace, which includes the history of the last two changes, you know, the current and the previous, which means you don't always have to go back to the server. It's better than absolutely centralized, but it still has its shortcomings. So what are the key strengths of a centralized source control system? The first is it easily scales to very large code bases. You know, a few years ago, Microsoft themselves had uh, you know, all the teams using Team Foundation version control, and they had huge code bases, as huge as 500 gig to a, a terabyte. And it can deal with that, no issues. The other benefit that it offers you is very granular permission control. What that means is if you wanted to uh, apply permissions at the file level, and audit permissions at the file level, this allows you to do it because you have that constant connection back to the server where you can validate if someone's authorized to see that file and then deny them if they're not. Uh, it, it permits monitoring and usage. Um, so if you're working in a, you know, in a space where you have IP and code and you kind of want to track who's accessing that code and why and when they're using it, then it gives you that auditing. Um, what it also allows you to do, do is set up exclusive locking. So if you go on the server and say, I want to exclusively lock this file out so no one can edit it, then it allows you to do that. It's best suited, as I said, for uh, large code bases. Uh, it's best suited when you want to have an audit and access process. And it's also meaningful to have TFVC as your preferred source control system if the files and the types of projects that you're creating within that are hard to merge. For example, a few years back, um, you know, SSIS or BizTalk, these kind of, it was very hard to merge them. You literally had to override the code in branch B from branch A if you were going to merge them. And they're really just suited for centralized where you can have exclusivity in the locking uh, and have limited number of people make the changes so the merging becomes easier. Distributed on the other side, as the name suggests, is distributed. You know, you don't have a central authority. Every node is a server in itself, if you want to put it that way. That could be on a client machine or on a, or on a server. It doesn't really matter. Um, but the biggest benefits with distributed is that you have cross-platform support. So if you were working in a team where you had people working on Windows, Linux, Mac, then this would just work, where all of you across all of the devices, types of devices and types of OS could use the same uh, source control model. The other benefit that it gives you is it has a lot of automation baked in into the source control system. And we'll talk about that in future videos like Git hooks, uh, like a pull request, um, and you know, really fantastic features that allow you um, to review the code and automate a lot of the processes that you would run on the code. It has complete offline support. When you clone a repository, you get the full history of the repository, which means you, know, you could go back uh, to as far back as you wanted but without having connectivity back to the server. The drawback, of course, is with offline connectivity, uh, with, uh, you know, with full history, if the history was really, really large or if the code base was really large, that operation would take a rather long time to complete. And that is why Git is best suited, or distributed source control systems are best suited for smaller code bases, not for huge code bases. 
Um, the other benefit uh, with, uh, with uh, this type of code base is that it's got a very enthusiastic user base. And a lot of this user base is evolving the underlying framework in the open source. So it's gaining a lot of new features because of open source uh, contributions to it. It's best suited for small and modular code bases, uh, you know, for highly distributed teams, for teams that are working across platforms, and especially for projects that are greenfield. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, flip into a demo and we'll talk about, uh, you know, I'll, I'll show you the code hub within team services. I will give you a brief walkthrough of how the code hub is plugged in into the different parts within team services um, and how that overlap really helps you benefit from the integration that it offers. Alrighty, so I'm going to navigate into my Visual Studio team services account here. Now, if you don't have a Visual Studio Team Services account, you can navigate to visualstudio.com and create a free account for yourself. In this uh, Team Services account, I've got a demo project already. Now, if I go into the demo project and I click on code, it will directly take me into the code hub. Now, as you come into the code hub, you can see at the top left side here, you've got a repository called demo. Now, this demo repository is one that I'd created when I created the project. But as you can see, I haven't put any code in here, and that's why it's saying that I should initialize the repository by adding a readme file. I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to pull this down and show you some other repositories that I have here as well. Now, one really cool feature that's available within Visual Studio Team Services is that it gives you the ability to import an existing repository. If you're already using Git locally or on another platform like GitHub or privately hosting it, and you wanted to import a repository that you've been working on, then simply choose the import repository section and select the source type as Git and select, specify the clone URL of your Git repository. Now I've got a Git repository on uh, GitHub that I have been working on. So I'm going to click on clone or, or download and copy the, the endpoint, take it back to team services, put the clone URL here. Now, if this was a private repository that needed authorization, then of course I could se select this box, specify my username and the personal access token. But because GitHub is open source as is and my project as well, I don't need to specify that. And here you just specify the name of the target uh, repository that uh, you want to create as the, at the point of the import. So for demo sake, I'll call this import from GitHub and click import. Now, the import process entirely depends on how big your repository is. My repository is pro probably a, a few megabyte at best, and so the import process will finish fairly, fairly quickly. There you go, the import process is succeeded. Now, if I click on the files, I can see my full code base has been imported, um, and the history is intact as well. So if I go and click on history, I can see all the commits that were done. Now, this is really, really cool, right? If I had tags or if I had uh, branches, multiple branches and history, then all of that gets ported over, um, you know, which means you could just finish something here and start from exactly where you left within team services. Um, what this also gives you is the ability to import a repository from TFVC. Now, within team services, I have a project called Centralized System that has some code in it. As you can see on your screen now, we've got a branch called main. And within the main branch, we've got some legacy code lying in there. So I'm going to take the URI of this path, bring it back in here. As I have TFVC selected, I'm going to stick that in here. And then I have an option to migrate the history from this code base as well. You know, I can go as far as 180 days worth of history, but you know, if you know, this is something I created yesterday, so uh, it's not going to have a lot of history in there. You have to call out what you want the target uh, repository to be called, and I'm going to call it import from TFVC. Click import. Oops, I have a space in the path here, so I'm going to remove that and try again. Brilliant. There we go. Again, this is a tiny, tiny um, uh, centralized uh, repository, so it should probably be five megs or so. So the, the import should be fairly quick. There we go, the import is complete. If I click on files now and I click on history, you can see I've got the exact changes um, in there. And if I click on the item, it actually does a comparison as well. So I can see, uh, you know, I'm really putting the history to use now. 
So uh, with that, uh, you know, I can uh, import from existing repositories. I can go on the manage repository section where I have the ability to specify permissions. So if I wanted to lock down the master branch, for example, here, I could do that at the same time if I wanted to um, you know, give certain people access to this repository and specify what sort of accesses they had, then I can control that from here. There's also this really cool thing called branch policies, which we're gonna cover in a separate video in great detail. Um, but you know, you've got all the admin functions here as well. So because I'm the collection administrator here, I have the option of deleting the repository if I wanted to as well. Done. Now, if I go back, I wanna show you a few more things here. The first thing I wanna show you is uh, the Git um, setup within Visual Studio Team Services is the same Git version that you have on in the open source. Um, so if you wanted to use SSH, for example, then it allows you to do that. If I navigate into the uh, security section here, then in the SSH public key section, I can add an SSH key. I've already added one for the laptop that I'm using, but you could, of course, use the instructions here to generate a new SSH key and then add that here. Um, the other thing I wanted to quickly show you was the integration that the repository has within the other parts of Visual Studio Team Services. For example, if I go into the dashboard section, there's a widget available that will show me the churn in the code in my repository. Let me click Add, click Configure, and then as you can see here, it's, it's showing me that I have, from the import here, that I have two uh, commits in the repository in the last seven days. So is, if uh, tracking the code churn is something that you're interested in, then the out-of-box widgets kind of support that. The other thing that I wanted to show you was if you go into the work section in the backlogs um, and select on user story, I've got a user story here. Team services al allows you to create Git repository right from within work items here. So um, let me just create a new work item, call it maybe demo integration. Right click that and say new branch. And it gives me an option here to say, all right, this work item, you wanna create a new branch. You know, What branch do you wanna spin this off from? What is the branch name? And it just associates this uh, work item and links it so that you have that end-to-end -end traceability in place. The build system within uh, Visual Studio Team Services has gone through quite an evolution. The first generation build system was introduced with uh, TFS 2005. It was XML based and entirely driven by MS Build. Well, it, you know, it was kind of good, but it had its, had its limitations. You had to script stuff within XML, which was very tedious. So the user uh, functionality, you know, the, the user experience wasn't great. Then came the second generation, which was XAML based. Uh, it allowed you a very, um, cool workflow using the Windows Workflow Foundation where you could go out and set up conditional branches of execution within the build process. But that meant that you could not run it on non-Windows machines. You always needed Visual Studio or a, a XAML editor, which as is, is quite heavy. Um, and this was introduced back in TFS 2010. So, you know, it has its pros and cons, but it wasn't cross-platform, which was a big limitation. In uh, 2015, TFS 2015, Microsoft came out with the third generation of the build system, which is called Team Build. Now, the design principles of Team Build, the first principle was that it has to be cross-platform. Let's try not to create a new language. Let's try not to create a new system altogether, but let's just keep it very simple and open and cross-platform by giving you an executioner uh, which can orchestrate any tasks. You tell it what task it needs to orchestrate, uh, and, and the tasks that you provide should be open source so you can look at them, you can improve them, you can create your own. Um, but the key thing is it should be cross-platform and pretty light. And that's exactly what's been delivered. Team Build is, uh, you know, it's an, it's an extensible task-based execution system with a very rich web interface that allows you to author, queue, and monitor builds. It's fully cross-platform cross uh, with the underlying agents being open source as well. They can natively run on Windows, Linux, Mac. Um, you know, it provides you out-of-box integration with centralized and distributed version control systems, and it works on any platform for any app. So we'll see some of that in action as well later in the demo. But I would encourage you to go off and check out the 
uh, team build uh, agent uh, and the task repositories in, in, on Git, uh, GitHub. Very popular, plenty of forks on it. Um, and so if you wanna add stuff to it, then go for it. Okay, uh, enough talking, let's get right into a demo. In this demo, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create our first pipeline. Um, let me just flip right into the demo here. Okay, so what I have here on the screen is a new a repository that I've created, I've called it Summit. And the Summit repository at the moment has two projects in it. The first project that it has is a web project. It's just a vanilla blank ASP.NET project. And then the second is a, is a default unit test project with some three unit tests in it. If I go back here and I click on my repository, I have an option to create a build for this repository. If I click that, it takes me right into the build workflow. Again, you don't have to follow this path. You can of course navigate directly into the build hub, but by choosing that button, it pre-takes all the repository configuration um, and can detect a few things in the way of doing that. So, um, you know, the project types we have are best suited for Visual Studio at the moment, so let's select the Visual Studio uh, template. But again, you don't have to select a template if you're doing something bespoke. You can obviously start off with an empty process. Um, if you scroll down, you'd see that there are plenty of pre-canned uh, templates available. So if you're doing Android development or Maven if you're doing Java, or Service Fabric, or if you're just taking stuff on from Jenkins, then all of that integration uh, is available and it's, uh, it's pre-canned so that you don't have to write it off yourself. So when I click Apply, it gives me the, the list of tasks for my Visual Studio build type. Um, you know, there, there's a, there are a few here. Uh, the first one is Get Sources. Now at the moment, I'm getting the sources from my repository here called Summit but by no means does the repository need to be within Visual Studio's team services. It can natively compile and integrate with GitHub, with your own custom Git repository and subversion as well. The next option is to restore all the NuGet package references that I've taken within my solution. Again, this is going out to the public repo, but if you've set up your own private NuGet repo, then you can configure the path to that. The build solution just uses MS build to uh, detect uh, and compile the code um, and then the test um, task is just looking for test using the DLL naming convention that's specified here. And then um, there's an option to specify which version of Visual Studio you wanna do uh, use for the test execution. I'm gonna change the, the, the test task from V1 to V2. Again, that's a pretty cool feature within the team build system where you can have multiple versions of a task available within a pipeline. And uh, the preview tasks, you're not forced to pick them up right away, but it starts to show up here to say there is another version available, you might wanna try it out. And in this case, we can try it out because this version two offers um, code coverage uh, natively. So I'm gonna change the version to 2017 and enable um, picking up the, uh, the code coverage so that once the tests are executed, I can see what portion of my code they're, they're actually covering. The rest of the settings you don't really have to change. This is simply publishing the symbols, i.e. the PDB file, so you, it kind of aids you when you're debugging your code. And then the next option is to take the compiled bits and save them in an artifact repository, which is hosted within uh, Visual Studio Team Services. So without making any further changes, I'm simply gonna save this uh, build, and I'm gonna go into the options section and change the repository from hosted to hosted Visual Studio 2017. That's because I'm taking a dependency on Visual Studio 2017. At this point, I'll click Save again. I'll go back to Task, and I will click, click Q. Now at this point, I can review uh, the specifications and click Q. At this point, Visual Studio Team Services is gonna take the, the definition, uh, identify an agent up on the server, and then pass over the definition to the agent, which can then start working through the tasks that have been defined. It can usually take a minute or two for the agent to be available, but it's pretty quick. As you can see, it's starting to execute uh, the, the build. The first task was to go and uh, download the source code. Um, it's actually gonna do that once it downloads the actual tasks that it needs to execute. Now this is another great uh, enhancement in the team build uh, now, uh, as compared to the previous version where uh, this is uh, giving you the live view of uh, the agent. Previously, you didn't really have a live log, so you had to wait for the build to finish to figure out what was going on. In this case, the console gets updated in real time. Great, so the build's complete now. Um, 
You can see the logs here, which is a great way of uh, you know, seeing if things fail. You can go through them in detail. You can download them for later as well. If I go in the code coverage section, it gives me an option to download the code coverage. Um, I can see the full test execution details here, here as well. And if I had any failed tests here, then I'd be able to see the stack trace and click on it to actually get navigated into the code, which will reflect where the test had broken. I have an option to see the test execution details. And then further on from here, I can actually pin it to the dashboard. This is something I'll cover in the next video anyways. So I'll just skip through this, uh, go back into the edit build definition here and show you a few more options. The first is variables. Uh, it is a way of specifying constants or values that you want to use within your build workflow. Again, this is something we'll cover separately. Triggers is, is where you would specify what is the execution model for the build, whether it needs to be triggered every time code is committed, or whether it's scheduled to run once in whatever time span you define. Um, and if you enable this, you have an option to turn on the build based on repositories or specific file types as well. I'm gonna leave this switched off for the minute. Um, in the option section gives you the option to specify the build numbering format, enable the badge. Again, this is something we'll cover in great detail when we talk about build versioning. Um, and then this is where you would specify where you want your build to execute, whether on the agent, uh, which is hosted by Microsoft, or on a private agent that you're hosting yourself. Uh, the retention policies are defaulted to 10 days. Um, and 30 days, but you can, of course, change that if you want to retain the bills for a longer period. Um, and history is where all the changes that you've made to the bill definition are recorded, and you have a way of comparing uh, the changes that you've made. So if you make any changes that tend to break what you've done, then you have a way of going back as well uh, by simply right-clicking and saying, uh, restore to previous version. Are you and your project teams in debt? There's only one way to find out. In this video, we're going to talk about technical debt. Technical debt, unlike financial debt, is very hard to discover and even harder to pay off. The problem with, uh, with uh, working in software teams is at times you're pressed with tight deadlines. And it's just obvious to take shortcuts. Um, and these shortcuts manifest themselves as, as shortcomings within the software that you're creating. When you come to fix or add new features, you're limited because you have to go and address these issues first, which impacts your overall ability to deliver software. Now, as you can see, we're going to focus exclusively on technical debt in the next few videos. And in this video, we'll talk about what technical debt is and, and how to identify it and what are the common issues that, um, that you will run into when you have technical debt. Uh, and over the next videos, we'll talk about some open source tools that allow you to identify and address technical debt. Um, more specifically, we'll talk about SonarCube and NDepend, very, very popular in the open source. All right, so if, uh, if you come from a programming background or, or have worked uh, in, in a job where you had to code, you know, these are the seven deadly developer sins. First is duplication. You know, you press with deadlines. Let me just copy this code because I know it works. And uh, it, the other option is, of course, go and making that function generic and then use it across multiple places. Uh, but it's always quicker and easier to just duplicate that code. Um, have you ever seen a function that is over 100 lines, 200 lines? It's because uh, you know it, it's just easier to continue editing and creating more logic in a function that already exists rather than branching it out to create new functions. Have you seen a spaghetti design where uh, the presentation layer is, is holding the business logic as well as communicating with the backend database? Um, have you seen a code base that lacks any unit test. And unit tests in this modern world are really the documentation that you need to understand what's going on in the code. If you go and check out any of the repositories on GitHub, pretty much all of them have, uh, have unit tests. That's because that's the way to learn about code. No coding standards, that's a common one. Potential bugs, not enough comments, or just having Gabo comments. There's actually a very funny uh, post on Stack Overflow, if you go and search for it, which says, what are one of the most hilarious comments that you've found in your code base? And one that stands out is a developer saying, this function does something. I'm trying to work out what it does. If you find out, leave a comment here. And you know, generally, that comment has no value. So why even write it? If you're going to write something, write a unit test, because that's the best way to document your code. Um, but, but these things are quite common. When you look at a code base, uh, these things happen because people are short of time, or they're not 
um, you know, technical, uh, mature enough to know what's the right way of implementing stuff. So there is technical debt that gets introduced because of lack of technical skills. There's technical debt that gets introduced because of, um, you know, timelines and deadlines. Uh, generally, uh, project teams have some sort of process to review code, um, and really it looks like this. If you're writing good code, there's going to be less stuff talked about when the code review happens, and when there is not so good code, then things can go pretty nasty. But while this is a way of measuring how your code is, this isn't a way of consistently measuring your code across industries. You know, number of shouts per minute means nothing. You can't really benchmark the quality of your code with that. You know, when, when I talk about financial debt, if you take on a loan, you know, you get this statement every month telling you that you're this much in loan and this much in debt and that you can make a plan to pay it off. But in code, unless you have a way of tracking how much debt you currently have, you can't really make a plan to pay it off. And so what ends up happening is exactly this. You know, your pipeline to deliver quality, your pipeline to deliver new functionality, your pipeline to get uh, and, and you know, engage with the business to explore new opportunities, it's just, it's, it's not practical anymore. It's, it, it's penetrated, it's broken. And so in real life, you know, and this is, this is data coming from projects that I worked on, is uh, you start off with this amazing sprint one where you've delivered about 15, 20 story points worth of work, but taken some shortcuts. So you kind of pay that off in the second sprint and third sprint and fourth sprint. Following on from the sixth or seventh sprint, you have so much debt in your code, so much duplication that you touch one method, no unit tests, which means you impact another part of the application which introduces more bugs, you end up just fixing bugs rather than adding any new functionality or really delivering any new functionality to your customers. So now that we understand what technical debt is and you know what are the common ways it gets introduced, um, we're gonna talk about the tooling uh, in place and, and that you can leverage um, within a VSTS to um, identify whether you have technical debt and then create a plan to pay that technical debt. This tooling also allows you to measure uh, your technical debt in an automated fashion. So pretty much as you commit code, you get a view of how much debt are you introducing in the code or how much debt you're paying off that already exists in the code. Welcome back. In this video, we're gonna talk about creating deployable artifacts from build pipelines. So far, we've seen uh, a CI pipeline that publishes an artifact which has got a bunch of DLLs in it, but you don't wanna just simply push DLLs on your server where you intend to deploy the application. If you're doing web-based development, then web deploy has been a, a, a means of deploying web-based application. I think it was, it was introduced back in 2005, 2006, um, and has significantly matured over the years, and the tooling around it has improved as well. So while you can create web deploy packages from Visual Studio, you can also create web deploy packages right from within Visual Studio Team Services. Um, and the process of creating it, it's so simple that you, know, you would question, why wasn't I doing it forever? Um, all right, so this, this video specifically focuses on build automation and within build automation, the build artifact creation process. Now, if you aren't doing web-based application, you're doing desktop-based applications or Windows services, then there are other frameworks then that you can couple in into a build pipeline to generate the artifacts. Um, you know, artifacts then can be pushed out using release management uh, on servers where you intend to deploy them. All right, in, uh, in, the, in, in this demo, we'll start off by using the um, application that we had created before, a simple web-based application, nothing more, just a vanilla MVC app with a with few unit tests, and we're gonna plug in the MS build web deploy parameters to it, and I'll walk you through the parameters, uh, into a CI pipeline to generate an artifact. Let's get right into a demo then. So um, on my screen here in Visual Studio, I've loaded up the uh, submit.web and submitweb.test project that I had created before. You know, nothing more, just simply a web app. Let's uh, run this up, F5 it. As you can see, it's, it's just the default template. Now, from within Visual Studio, you have an option of right-clicking and saying publish. And when you do that, it actually triggers a, a, a web deploy option for you where you can go off, create a profile. Now, where instead of doing this, we'll do it from within the build pipeline because you don't want to be publishing stuff right from within your desktop machine. 
So if I go back into Visual Studio Team Services, from within Visual Studio Team Services, we've created a build pipeline for Summit Master. And as you can see, it's a standard Visual Studio template pipeline, which only has the additional Git version task in it. So um, if we go and trigger the build, you would see that uh, when the build completes that there's not gonna be any specific build output. We'll just have DLLs being generated. As you can see, the build's completed. If I click on the build and I choose the artifact section and I click explore, and I navigate into the artifacts that have been generated, you would see that I have a folder for web tests, but you know I don't really have any other artifacts that are generated. So I can't really publish anything uh, for my web application. But we can change that very quickly by going into Summit Master, editing the build definition, going into the build solutions tab, and here you have an option of specifying MS Build arguments. Now, uh, MS Build has plenty of uh, arguments that are available, and you can go and look it up on, on Google. Uh, but the ones that we are interested in are these ones, and I'll explain them in a second. So what we're saying here is we want to deploy as part of this build. We want to use the web publish method, so create a package for us. We want the package to be surfaced as a single file, which means zip it and then skip any invalid configuration, and this is the location where we want the package to be created. Now, you of course want the package to be created in the build staging area, and as you can see, this is a predefined variable existing uh, within the, the build, uh, you know, the, the team build solution, so you don't have to go and handcraft an output destination yourself. So if I just simply include this and uh, queue a new build now, Now that the build is complete, if I go back into the build details and go into artifacts and I click explore, you can see that in addition to the previously generated DLLs, there is now, pre, you know, this was being previously generated, but in addition to that, that we have this section at the bottom here. And this section has the summit.web.zip. Now the zip file has the relevant binaries that are required to publish the application using uh, web deploy. In addition to that, it's created a parameters file, which is an XML file. And I can use this file for tokenizing the configuration files that I have within web.zip. Um, I'm gonna cover tokenization and, and config uh, value replacement in a future video, but just so that you know that it gets generated as, as part of the, the MS build web deploy workflow, so you don't have to go off and seek other ways of tokenizing your config files. So, so with that, you know, we saw in this video how easy it is to actually uh, generate web packages uh, using uh, your build system. Now, you know, if you are still publishing your web applications manually by t taking DLLs that are compiled on your server and copying them across to production, then you're doing it wrong. It's when things fall apart and you question, can we recreate the app on another server, that you go and find that you don't even have a single source of truth from where the application originated. By doing this, you are one, committing your code into the code repository and generating a, a full fidelity package um, from a build so you've got that end-to-end -end traceability. And in future video, we'll see how we can just simply take this package, attach it to a release definition, and use a release, release agent to directly deploy onto the, onto the target machine as well. But this is the building block to that. Now that you've matured your practices and the technical delivery capabilities to get to a continuous delivery stage, it's worth looking at what it would take to go the full mile into a continuous deployment mode of delivery. So what is continuous deployment? Well, clearly continuous delivery means being able to deliver, having a deliverable code base at all times, and continuous deployment means you're always deploying. Now remember, deploying code is not equal as releasing code. As long as you can deploy your code but hide it using feature flags and some of the other techniques, 
you have a cap on what the customer can see and what they can't see. But having the ability to constantly deploy means if there are failures, you're a better place to recover from them in near real time. Now, I've redone this slide because there's so much we need to talk about if we look at continuous deployment. In terms of continuous deployment, the, key, the, the two key things we're gonna cover is staged deployments. This is a capability that's available within release management. It's pretty neat because you know, traditionally when you've had to do phase deployments with servers that are load balanced, database that are load balanced, it's always been tricky. But having a, a feature that's baked in into the product that allows you to roll a feature out uh, you know, in a format where you could command it to roll the feature out on 20% of the servers or 30% of the servers, and it doing the heavy lifting is, is pretty impressive. Uh, the other thing we're gonna cover is feature flags. How feature flags can help you constantly deploy code in production but hide it, at the same time run experiments in production where you can uh, enable features for certain customers, gather feedback, or even not for customers, for yourself. You know, as a developer, if you're releasing or a new code into production, you wanna gauge how well that code is performing before you open it up for everyone. Um, and then it gives you a way of deploying and testing with real production data. A really, really useful thing to have, especially if you're going with uh, continuous deployment. Then we're gonna look at App Insights, um, a framework that allows you to capture telemetry back from, from, from the real world and then leverage that telemetry to improve your product. Um, so let's talk about practices for continuous deployment. By no means these uh, you know, continuous deployment practices means that you can forget what we learned in the last module. These only supplement uh, and, and, and go forward from what we've already accomplished. The first one I wanna mention here is microservices-based architecture. Now clearly you cannot have a monolith application and continuously deploy to it. It's, it's just not practical. A system that is so coupled together will fall over if you try and deploy to it uh, ever so often. You need an architecture that's capable of being decomposed that can have some sort of uh, circuit break, break pattern. So if things fail, for example, they don't take the entire system down. Um, and microservices as an architecture just lends itself to that where you could run up some microservices in containers. By the way, containers uh, is a course that is available on EDX and you should absolutely go and check it out. Um, and then what you could do there is um, spin up a new instance of a container, scale that, and then start redirecting the traffic there. But you can't do all of that unless you have a, a, an architecture in place that, that allows you to go the continuous deployment mile. The other thing that's worth considering it, uh, is a minimal viable product approach. You know, you have to think in small increments. Increments that make sense shipping. There's no point creating an Eiffel Tower when the customer only needs a Seattle needle, right? I mean, the whole point is deploy in small chunks and engage your customers to get real-time feedback. And that's best done if you keep the mentality to a minimal viable product so that you can see whether it meets the business priorities or not. The other, the other uh, thing that you need to remember uh, is, you know, if you're going continuous deployment, there's no looking back. You, you cannot have rollback systems in production. You, you can only have roll forward. So when there are failures, you fix the code and you roll a new process out and that, that kind of fixes the issue. Um, clearly that means you need a pretty quick and neat release process, a release process that is capable of allowing you to roll out releases in near real time. Um, you need an applications and operations telemetry system. I mean, you can't be continuously uh, deploying and only finding out from customers by service tickets when things are broken. You gotta be ahead of the game. You gotta have proactive alert alerting, and even a step further, proactive alerting that can self-heal the infrastructure. Events that can capture and alert the, the systems that they need to scale up, scale down, amend, append, and that can only be done with, uh, with, with systems like App Insights, New Relic, and some of the other ones that are out there. The other thing you wanna talk about is meaningful metrics, right? There's no point measuring engineering with uh, you know, uh, KPIs like velocity, and you know, it just makes no sense. You need to have business driven KPIs if you're doing continuous deployment. KPIs that encourage you to think as a team. KPIs that give you the business mentality. For example, you'd be interested in knowing how many users upgraded to the latest version of the product. How many users are using the new feature that you rolled out. You're less probably worried about what is the overall velocity of the team and comparing that to another team, right? That's very much uh, a, te a technical um, uh, KPI and that's not one that you wanna measure when you're doing continuous deployment. 
Now, some of the techniques that I'm going to mention briefly because we'll cover them in the demos is things like feature flags, you know, really, really powerful, allow you to experiment and innovate in production, give you the capability of switching on, switching off features, and also encourage you to do that, um, uh, you know, play, play, with, uh, play with functionality in production, encourages you, you to test for functionality in production. Again, you know, the best place to test is production because the data you get in production is like no other. And so having feature flags means you could enable selective functionality for selective test for selective audiences. Uh, the next technique out there is blue-green deployments, right? I mean, blue-green is a technique for deployments where the existing running deployment is left in place, and you provision new servers where you deploy stuff, and then you flip over. Um, the slots within uh, web app in Azure is one way of manifesting that. Dockers and containers give you uh, the ability to do that as well. I mean, some of the some of the, the the Docker stuff is really impressive, where you can spin up new containers and have uh, the processes consume those containers. And when you're confident, you make those containers live, and the other ones you can start to phase out over time. Uh, the next technique worth mentioning is canary releases, where rather than doing a, a you know like a phased deployment, you first test your deployment on a a, a tranche, and then once you're happy you kind of load balance the traffic across and then start to service the other servers. Again, a very impressive uh, and useful technique, one we will slightly cover when we talk about um, you know, phased deployments, a feature that's available in release management. The last thing I want to talk about is you cannot be continuously deploying unless you have security in the fold. I mean, the cost of a data breach today is significant, but the brand cost that it brings is irreparable. And I say that because I've seen organizations go down because they've leaked, uh, leaked PR data, customer data. And so that's just unacceptable. But you don't want to slow down your delivery chain because security are going to take significantly longer to validate whether systems are secure or not. It's all about pushing left. It's all about bringing them into your workflows of automation. It's all about having the pipelines being capable enough running the security checks that security would run otherwise. And, and you would see that as you take them into the fold, the collaboration between the two teams would improve, which will only improve your ability to deliver code, deliver functionality, and deliver even faster. Now that you've mastered continuous integration and seen all aspects of um, you know, writing better code, um, then having that code being inspected, um, you know, having that code produce an artifact, you're probably thinking, you know, what is there left now? I've, I've got a CI process that can generate artifacts. We're kind of good to go, right? Now, I, I get this uh, question asked a lot to me. Uh, that is, uh, you know, what can we automate? We have a process that works, and why do we need to automate it, or what do we need to automate? So there's, there's this really nice theorem that's called the pizza theorem. And what it is is, um, have you ever had this one time in the office when a pizza was called for? And why was a pizza called for? A pizza was called for because something broke in production, or someone had to do manual testing. So their manager wanted them to sleep during the day and come during the night because a release had to happen, and they had to take down the systems. And it was going to be a long night, and pizza was called for. Uh, or whether it could be when there was a problem in production and you had to sit down all night comparing server A to server B, pizza was called for. You know, and, and as a trade-off to having you do manual activity, you're offered a pizza. But the problem here is that while pizza is cheap and so is labor, you cannot scale an operation that's driven by manual activity. So while you have a full-fledged CI process, to take it the full mile, you need to have a continuous deployment lifecycle. And in this module, that's exactly what we, will be, what we will be covering. We'll take our CI process, mature it, so that we can go the full mile into a CD process. And when I say CD here, I'm referring to continuous delivery and not continuous deployment. Continuous deployment is something we'll talk about in the module after that. So join me in this journey where we will take our continuous integration output, look into release management, which gives us the automated provisioning and automated deployment capability, and then in future modules, we'll cover how we can get um, you know, a usage insights, diagnostics, and telemetry out from production back into our dev lifecycle to finally improve our product and be on top of our game and proactively fix issues before they happen. Now, the key difference, as you would see here in my continuous delivery pipeline, is, is that while we take 
follow the same steps as CI, and we have deploy to test environment and automated testing, there's a manual approval process before that release that's ready to be released is actually released in production. So continuous delivery effectively means your ability to continuously deliver, but having a process where someone presses a button, consciously making a choice to deploy the ready to release uh, bits out into production. And that's the key difference between continuous delivery and continuous deployment as well, is where in continuous deployment, you're always deploying without having any kind of manual uh, checks uh, in place for someone to press the button. Whereas in continuous delivery, you have that conscious judgment to make to say, yes, I want to make a release. Uh, but you know, there, there is a certain maturity that's required from con continuous delivery to continuous deployment. Again, that's something we'll cover in a future video. Um, so what are the eight principles of continuous delivery? The first principle is process for releasing and deploying software must be repeatable and reliable. Now, you cannot have a process that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't work. And, and the classic uh, case uh, I've seen is let's create a pipeline and let's use that pipeline for deploying uh, new features. But anytime there's a problem in production, we'll just manually compile the DLLs and copy them across to the server. You're only setting yourselves uh, up for failure wherein now those DLLs are manually deployed. Next time you deploy them, you're going to override them. You have no clue whether the changes were synced back into the process or not. So design your CD pipeline keeping the you know, failure cases in mind. But keep it simple. You know, don't design an Uber process. Design a process that works, that's simple, so that it can fit not only the day-to-day -day feature development lifecycle, but the support scenarios as well. Automate everything. You know, if it's hard, automate it and do it as often as possible. That is, in my opinion, the key single uh, principle that you should start off with. Uh, and, you know, any, any process that you see, anytime you see that pizza being ordered, you should challenge and automate that process because you just cannot go continuous delivery with a manual process. If something is difficult or painful, do it more often. Keep everything in source control. Now, we've talked about this in, in previous module as well, that whether it's your, your source code, whether it's your database, whether it's your configuration, whether it's your infrastructure, everything that your software depends on needs to be in version control. There is no continuous delivery, or let me put it this way, there is no continuous in your delivery if you don't have a version control system in place. Done means released. How many times have you seen a developer saying, yep, done, but it's not really done. It's 99% done. I still have to write some unit test. I still have to write the script to deploy it. You know, I still have to make configuration changes. It's not done till it's not released. And I think that's, that's one way of measuring anything. You know, if, if you want to take a piece of functionality and claim that it's, it's complete, well, don't make a claim until it's fully deployed in production. And, and that's how I would measure it when I'm talking about continuous delivery. Build quality in. And, and so far in all the videos, we've seen how a version control system like Git allows us to um, put in quality as a step number one when we're writing the code. How Sonar Cube and NDepend allow us to keep a check on technical debt that's being introduced. How CI uh, process allows us to quickly refactor our code, look at the code coverage. So you have to build quality in from day one. You cannot have a continuous delivery pipeline if your code is not mature, if you're if you're, you know, if you're lacking in the technical maturity uh, uh, section within your, within your team's uh, delivery capability. It's a joint responsibility. Everyone is collectively responsible for the release process. You, know, you can't have the, the teams sitting in silos saying, oh, that, that task to deploy the database, that's not mine, that's his, right? It's, you have to look at the holistic picture. You cannot get software out in, in disjointed teams where there is no shared responsibility. The CD pipeline should truly reflect a collective ownership of deploying the product out in the market rather than the individual components of the product. And it goes without saying, you know, build, measure, learn. Look at where you are within your CD pipeline. Take a, take a gauge on whether, you know, what the constraints are. And constraints, that's an important thing as well, right? You, you can only go as fast as within the boundaries of the constraints. Now, if you have third party vendors that are shipping for you that force you into a certain SLA, well, that's your constraint then. But you optimize the output from your machinery, keeping these constraints in mind. So build, measure, learn, assess, see where there's scope for improvement and keep improving your CD lifecycle. Now with these eight principles come four practices. The first practice is build once, deploy everywhere. Now this is really key because 
what you don't want to do is create a build pipeline that produces an artifact, and then what you do is you deploy that artifact in a, in a test environment, but when you have to deploy to production, you create an artifact from scratch. What's the point? You know, if you deploy one thing in one environment and another, another thing in another environment, well, then you're effectively deploying for the first time in production, and what's the point of having deployed in another environment? You have to create one artifact and then take that artifact on a journey through all the test environments, release environments, canary environments that you have in place. Have a, have a unified deployment process for all environments. You know, there's no point in doing uh, one type of deployment in one environment and then doing something completely different in another environment. You might as well just do it once in production then because what you're doing across on, on the other environments is not relevant unless it's unified across the board. Um, smoke test your deployments. You know What's wrong with rolling something out into a test environment and having scripts in place that can do the hotspot checks to see whether the deployment's correct? Don't waste your testing resource on you know, doing environment or smoke test activities. Your test resource should really be focused on testing for value, testing for, for functionality, rather than testing for minor technical things that can easily be automated. Um, don't try and tweak stuff when, when things break. Fix it. Like if you have a pipeline that breaks, uh, if you have flaky unit tests that break in a CI pipeline, you know, don't just say, let me comment this out because they sometimes pass, they sometimes fail. Go and address the issue because you cannot have a reliable CD pipeline unless all the components in the pipeline uh, are fit for purpose. And flaky unit tests certainly don't make it fit for purpose. Now you'd see that I've updated this slide now that we have made the full journey of CI and build automation. I want to uh, take into factor that we have released management, again, a cross-platform solution provided by Microsoft uh, within the scope of Visual Studio Team Services. Amazing integration with open source, whether it's Jenkins, whether it's Octopus, whether it's Atlassian Stack, whether it's GitHub, you know, it, it just integrates naturally with everything. Um, and you'd see that the overlap between team build and release management is just, it, it just feels like you if you learn one, you know both of them. So. Um, so what we'll look at now is we'll look at release management and we'll see how we can automate the infrastructure provisioning, as in have code for our infrastructure. And you know, while we we'll discuss about this, I would encourage you to go and take the other courses that are available on the EDX library that go into a lot of detail on infrastructure as code. Uh, we'll go into how we can then use this infrastructure as code to provision new infrastructure using a release pipeline. We'll look at how we can write open source uh, Selenium framework-based test that can be used as functional test, how we can create availability and load uh, tests right from within Visual Studio Team Services, and then define some sort of a lightweight release management process for someone to press that button to have the release rolled out in a test environment. Now, when you start on this journey of deployment automation, you start to look at the application-specific items that are related to the environment that you're deploying to. Now, if you're only doing a one-off deployment or you know, maybe two deployments in a day, it's still OK to manually transform the config. But I must warn you that manually transforming uh, or updating the config file per the environment introduces an element of risk where you may accidentally forget to update the config file. And it may point to another test environment database. And you may start to get you know, erroneous uh, outputs in your application wondering, why is this suddenly stopped working? Only to figure out that it was a config uh, value update that uh, was, was skipped as part of the rollout of the application on the test environment. Other scenarios where it can impact you is I've seen teams taking uh, backup of applications from production to set it up on test environments. And it can be very expensive if then you forget to update the connection string. And provided there is no fence of permissions, you could then accidentally end up writing into your production systems from your test systems. You know, I've seen that happen in, in customer sites where there isn't fencing in place between test environments and production, taking a backup, not having an automated process to sanitize the environment can cause these issues. So both from a uh, you know, speed point of view, as well as from a resilience point of view, it makes sense to have an automated process for running the config transformation. Now there is a full course coming on the EDX library uh, very soon which will talk about config management, not only from an application point of view, but from a server point of view and overall configuration management. In this video, we're very much just gonna focus on the application configuration transformation, and, and that too 
look at you know simple things like connection strings, things like log folder locations. These are settings that you have in app config files and web config files that you just want transformed as you roll these out into test environments. This video is very much focused on the, the deployment automation side of things, more specifically to the provisioning and the deployment of the application. Okay, so uh, let's get into a demo. So I've got the same pipeline uh, that we have been setting up for Summit Master. And in this pipeline, I've added a new task called the Replace Tokens task. Now, uh, you can search for this task called Replace. Um, and if, if this doesn't show up here, and the chances are it won't, is because it's not a Microsoft-provided extension. It's an open source extension. So you have to go into the marketplace and search for Replace Token and then install it uh, for your instance of Visual Studio Team Services. You'd see that you're spoiled for choice here where there are so many tasks available for tokenization. Uh, pretty much all of them, um, you know, give and take do the same thing, uh, but have different implementations. So I found this one quite useful. I found the one provided by Colin quite useful as well. You know, in essence, one gives you a, a regex format that is capable of scanning all the config files across your application and then using that regex format to identify if it has any matches. And then it looks at the variables, uh, either the environment variables or the application variables, that have the same matching name to one that is being tokenized. And then where there is alignment, is, it does the replacement. Let's see this in action. So within the pipeline now that we have the task, let's click on the task. We have an option to say, what is it that we want to transform? Now, in this case, I'm transforming an XML file, and I'll explain why. But you could have an option to transform a config file, whether an app config. You could make it quite loose with wildcard characters, or you could make it very specific and generic, uh, very specific to a, a one specific um, configuration file that you want to update. And again, you can clone uh, this uh, multiple times if there are multiple config files across multiple solutions that you need updating. Now, as I'm doing this in the build, I'm running this step before I'm creating the package, which means I'm updating the configuration for sanitization or for packaging. But you could run the same operation in a release pipeline and have the application roll the release out and then run this task to validate the configuration or update the configuration. All it does behind the scenes is look for the config file, match the regex, look for the, the variable names, match those variable names to ones you have in the build, and then simply replace the value. And because the build infrastructure allows um, you to specify variable names that can be encrypted, it just sits very nicely together where you don't have to manage passwords in a separate password save or in separate config files or Excel spreadsheets. So if we look at this here, um, it also preserves the encoding of the file, which I think is quite good. But you also have the option of specifying exclusively what the encoding should be, if this is something you want to enforce in your config files as well. Um, and then this is the, the format that um, in the advanced section that I'm looking for. I'm saying in the config file, if you find a similar format, then that's a, a valid candidate I want to have replaced as part of the config transformation. Now I need to make one additional change to the code base, and I'll show you what. So if we navigate back to the code base and open up the summit.web project, we have to add an XML file called the, package, uh, called the parameters file. Now the parameters file is, uh, is just a collection of parameter values that you want updated against your config file. And it supports um, XPath. So I'm basically saying here, you know, one of the parameters that I want to replace is the name of the environment. This is a description of what that variable is. The default value is this. Now you can see, referring back to the task I have, is I'm using the same regex format. I'm saying parentheses, hash, underscore, underscore, and then the name of the parameter. So when the task searches and finds this XML file, it will say, OK, there is a match. As long as I can find a variable called environment, I'll simply replace its value for this whole string. And then that's how the, the transformation is done behind the scenes. The second thing I have is a log file location. Again, I'm using the same uh, steps here. I'm saying this is the default value. Uh, it's an XML file type. And this is the exact match as to where it needs to be replaced. So I'm saying slash configuration, slash app settings, slash add key log, and this is the value. So if we go back into the web config, you'd see the XPath matches to this. We're saying configuration, app settings, 
log, and this is the value that needs to be replaced. So it's, a, it's quite a constructive way where you don't have to overload your web config directly. You can still have local values for your local machine. You can even use extensions like Slow Cheetah, uh, which are available within Visual Studio that allow you to use the configuration-driven um, uh, you know, config views that you have per the solution configuration, like for debug, for release, or the others you create. But then at the same time, it's, it's abstracting the override into a separate parameter file that the build can override for you, that the release can override for you. And as part of web deploy, web deploy is capable enough to take the parameter file and do the substitution for you uh, through the build and the release process. So having specified the parameters in the parameter file and having specified the actual parameters to be replaced in the web config file, I'm gonna go back into the build and quickly run, uh, execute the build. Now we'll, le we'll let it run. This may take a few minutes to complete. Since uh, most of my agents are running in dev test labs, I have an auto shutdown schedule set up there, so they all have been switched off. So instead of running it on my own private agents, I will run this on the uh, Visual Studio uh, hosted agent in the Microsoft Cloud. Right, so the build's complete here. Uh, if we click on the output here and navigate to the artifact section, click on explore, and then navigate down to the set parameters.xml. Let's download this file. Let's open this up. There you go. You can see that the values have been replaced here. And uh, let's, let's put this in context, take a step back and uh, look at the, the build setup that we had here. So as part of this step, which runs before the build, we're saying go look for any XML file, and within that XML file, search for the pattern which is specified here, and then wherever you find this pattern, look for the name match of any variables, and if we look in the variable section, I've defined two variables, environment and log, and they both have a value here. And if we go back into the code and check our web config, we have environment and, and log, and in the parameter file, it's exactly looking for environment and it's exactly looking for log specified within the, the regex pattern that we've specified. And that's how it applies the transformation. Now when you, um, now that it's, it's made the update to the, the, this specific XML file, the set parameter.xml, it's the set parameter.xml file that gets run as part of the, uh, the web deploy using MS build. And it will, during the deployment process, look at uh, the values within the set parameters and it will search for those values within the web package and do, the, do, do the, um, the transformation for you. This is one of the ways of doing it. I'm not saying this is the ultimate way of doing it. You could introduce the regex format directly in your config file and have it replaced there. You could run it a step before the web package gets created. You could run it a step after the web package gets created. But you know, all in all, this is one of the ways of doing it, and uh, regardless of the way you do it, it's important that you, you transform your config files as part of your build uh, or release step, just to ensure the sanity and the speed uh, within your continuous uh, delivery process. So wouldn't it be better if there was a way of releasing functionality into production, but then ahead of releasing it into production, releasing it into a test environment, and mimicking load that is production-like. Now, in the past, mimicking load that's been production-like has always been a challenge. And it's been a challenge because infrastructure had been expensive. You go and invest in buying a server that's production-like only to realize that when you aren't releasing stuff as often, what do you do with that high-end high uh, server, which is costing you a lot? And then 
chances are if it's a high-end server that's physical, then it's going to start degrading over the number of years. Now you need to find a replacement for it. Well, luckily with the cloud era, you don't need to worry about that. And with the era of Visual Studio Team Services, performance testing and availability testing is offered as a service, so you don't even need to set up your own kit. Um, if you have an application that doesn't require installing components and can communicate over HTTP or HTTPS, then this is a perfect match, a match made in heaven. In this video, we'll look at how we can supplement our build and release pipeline by adding out-of-box tasks to test for performance and availability. I'll also quickly show you that there are other libraries available with support running open source and third-party uh, performance tests like Apache, JMeter. Um, this uh, video entirely focuses on you know, test automation, but more specifically on performance testing, which I think is, is one of the fundamental uh, things that you need in any meaningful pipeline. All right, so without uh, further ado, let's uh, jump right into the demo. Okay, so summit.master, that's, uh, that's the pipeline we've been working on. And you see this pipeline's grown from just semantic versioning to one that's replacing tokens, creating packages, uh, publishing artifacts, consuming those artifacts to provision infrastructure, get some information sent back from that infrastructure provision, deploy the web app, deploy the DB, deploy, run the functional test. Now what we want to do after this is we actually want to run performance tests. So what I should do is look for a task that does that. I could navigate into the test section and you would see that there are a bunch of options available. There is cloud-based load test. Now if you are coming from an existing investment that you've made within performance testing using Visual Studio, um, then you would have um, a lot of Visual Studio specific load tests. This task allows you to use those tests and run them in your existing pipeline. If you're starting afresh and you don't have any, any tests available, you could actually launch Fiddler, start using your application, extract the Fiddler trace, and publish that as a, a test. There's a converter that allows you to convert your Fiddler traces into Visual Studio performance tests. You could also just submit the same uh, Fiddler traces as a perf test within Azure. So if you haven't started, getting started is fairly easy. But in this case, what we want to do is we want to add the cloud-based web performance test task. And if we click here, uh, it asks for a number of things. The first thing it needs is a connection back to Visual Studio Team Services. It's kind of funny you would say, hey, I'm running this task from an existing Visual Studio Team Services. Why do I need to tell it which Visual Studio Team Services instance to, to use? Now, certain organizations might have multiple VSTS accounts, and they may be stacking up a lot of credit for Visual Studio uh, load test virtual minutes in one of the accounts. This gives you a way of consuming virtual load uh, test minutes from any account. So you don't have to specify the same account that you're running from. You can optionally use any account. And that's the key purpose of having it here. Now, I've set up an endpoint here. You could do that by, by going over in the settings and creating an endpoint and putting your personal access token there. Uh, next thing, you need to specify the web URL of the server that you need to test. Like in this case, we have this specific page. But what if we are adding a new page called contact and we simply wanted to check as part of the deployment whether the contact page was deployed and it, it can bear the new load uh, that we anticipate. So we could fully qualify this, take this URL, put it here, and then it says give it a name. So let's call it perf, let's call it availability test for contact. Now it's giving you an option of how much user load do you want to mimic. You can go from 25 to 250, but there's nothing stopping you from putting more load on this. Um, so we'll start with the basic 25, and then it gives you an option of how long do you want to run that load up for. In this case, we're running for 60, but if you were using your own custom test rather than this out-of-box task, you could set up like a step load to say, I want the load to go up from 25 users to 250 users at a step of every 10 seconds. And that's more realistic, right? Because if your marketing team is going to go and launch a campaign, you're not going to get all the 100,000 users you think you're going to get in the first second. It's probably going to be a few people checking their emails and then browsing to your website. So you should really be testing your application for step load rather than just one static load. And if you want to do threshold testing, then you should keep pushing that step load up till your application starts to exhibit uh, areas of concern. 
and that will help you understand what is the maximum threshold capacity your application can survive. But, you know, but the core purpose of having this lightweight task, which is out of the box, is so that you can sense check for availability, but for advanced scenarios, you can create your task using Visual Studio. So in this case, we have an option to use automatically provision agent, and that's the one we want to use. But if we had like some very specific scenario where the agent needed some bespoke software, then we could self-provision our infrastructure. This option is also useful if you are hosting your, uh, your own infrastructure because of investments you've made in data centers or physical kit. Um, you know, apart from that, you don't really need to change anything. Uh, you do now have conditional um, uh, tasks within BSTS. So if, for example, this task fails, you could specify a custom condition to say, if that task failed or if this task failed, then do that. So it helps you build conditions. Uh, we don't need to set anything specific here. We'll just uh, skip over this and save this. Now let's trigger the execution of this pipeline. It's going to take a bit of time because we're running a bunch of tasks, but let, let's come back to the results when they're ready. The build's gone green here, as you can see. Let's scroll up to see what the end result was. Complete, high five. It's, um, it's uh, successfully executed the test. Um, you can see that it used this agent, uh, consumed the 250 virtual user minutes to run the load up using the specifications that we called out. So let's see the results. Let's go back into the build summary and let's go into the test section and let's go into the summary section we can see load test results. Now, uh, ready to be amazed. You will find the test results really, really useful. Click on the test run. I mean, look at this. You're not only triggering the test from the cloud test service, but you're getting very, very fine-grained results about what the average response time was, what the user load was, what the request per second was. And you have the ability to drill in and figure out you know, your response time, you know, percentage failure, what type of HTTP responses did you have, what kind of thresholds were hit, what errors happened. I mean, all of that available right from within the, 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 the web is just amazing. I mean, I come from the background where you had to run your test for load from Visual Studio. And so you had to have like, like the high-end version of Visual Studio, which was called Visual Studio Ultimate back in the day. And then the only way to see the test results was after the test execution completed. With the cloud version, you can actually see the test as the execution is in flight, which means if the tests are going off track and you're running for thresh and you start to see like a unique pattern, which could mean the, either the app is not deployed correctly or there are other issues, you have a chance of stopping the test. But in the early days, you could only see the results at the end of the execution by when it was pretty late to change any of or adapt your tests. So bringing it into the web is meaningful and, and surfacing that data in, in a way, in charts where you can see the performance, the throughput, the errors, the test, being able to see the data points, being able to go into diagnostics to see the specifics of IP protocol, you know, and, and I think being able to drill in further into this uh, with the logs I think is amazing. Um, and, and, you know, this is, the, this, is the, this is what you say, right? Like infrastructure is a commodity now and I would say Virtual uh, load testing is a commodity, and if you aren't using it in your build process or in your release pipelines, then now's the time to get started. So um, with that, we've seen how we can structure all the elements from a deployment point of view, infrastructure provisioning point of view, testing point of view within the build process. Join me in the next video where we'll take all of these elements and put them in a release pipeline. And that would be the true test, right? Because ideally, all of these activities should be part of your release pipeline. And so we'll see how this fits in into the structure of phases and how release management uh, will uh, behave when we run the individual phases on different agents. This is full DevOps, right? This is, this is what DevOps is all about. It's about having a process that allows you to go out to production, constantly deploy, 
And remember, constantly deploying something does not mean constantly releasing something. And the difference entails a new, whole new structure of practices that you need to follow, practices such as feature flags, practices such as phased rollout, practices such as experimentation. And that's exactly what we plan to cover in this module. Now, um, just to set the context, um, the key difference between continuous delivery and continuous deployment, as you can see on the slide, is um, continuous delivery is all about having a pipeline. But the step before releasing into production means you have a step approval process. And that step approval process in certain organizations could be a five minute job, could be a five day job. So sometimes it takes a long time to build that trust with the leadership team or the product owners um, and the product managers for them to allow you to roll out updates um, and, and deployments uh, as and when. Uh, but that is the nirvana state, and that's what continuous deployment is. Continuous deployment is being able to just commit your code, have a, have a high quality build output and artifact that gets added into a release train, and that a release train goes all the way out into production. Now, the unicorns, uh, and when I say unicorns, I mean the Netflix, the Facebooks, and you know these companies that have redefined how technology works, have been uh, doing these practices for a number of years now. But as you can see, uh, more of these practices are becoming uh, the norm in the industry and a lot more organizations are onboarding them. And so when you go in a conference and say, uh, you know, we release five times a day, it doesn't have the same impact anymore as it used to a few years back. But when you go to a bank and say, we release five times a day, how many times do you release? They're like, whoa, five times a day, we probably do one release in five months. So for them to, to make a journey all the way to continuous uh, deployment is, is quite a big challenge. And they have to go through the phases that we've talked about, get the CI right, you know, make sure the CI is reliable. It's, uh, it's one that you believe in and one that you want to improve on. Then get to the continuous delivery stage. Make sure you have the right quality factors built in. Make sure you can validate um, that you have a good tangible product before you roll it out with the right approvals. And when you're at that stage, you go full Monty with continuous deployment, right? That's what DevOps is all about. So I'm, I've changed this picture again for module three as we've covered CI, build automation, deploy, and test automation. We're gonna focus on some of the practices of continuous deployment. And one that I'm personally very excited about is um, feature flags. Um, and one that the product really allows you to do very easily now is staged deployments. Staged deployments you could do right from release management where you could decide to roll out updates to selective uh, Canary instances. Uh, but Azure supports it quite broadly within uh, web apps uh, wherein you can select and set up slots and then leverage those slots to phase in, phase out releases. Um, and then uh, at the tail end of the course, we'll look at uh, App Insights and how you can put App Insights to work um, to get real-time telemetry back from production. We'll also look at a nifty feature available within App Insights that gives you the integration from Visual Studio Team Services uh, and Azure to put a marker on App Insights, uh, and it's called release annotation. Uh, when you look at the data that comes back from production and things don't work out, the first thing uh, you ask is, did a release just go out? And that's what release annotations are. They just put a marker on your telemetry to say, this is a point where the release went out, and if after that point you see traffic going down or traffic significantly going up or certain exceptions or certain things happening, then you know that there's something fishy about this, uh, this uh, specific release. And that's an action point you can take away and investigate. So um, you know, practices for continuous deployment, like we talked about in continuous delivery, you know, there are some in industry standards and practices and, and the same applies to continuous deployment. Now I've listed some here. This just assumes that all the practices that we talked about when we talked about continuous delivery still apply. This is just stuff on top of that. And continuous deployment is about having an architecture that is microservices based. As, as I talked about previously, you cannot have a heterogeneous, uh, you cannot have a monolith application and service it in real time with multiple releases and deployments in a day, simply because every time a monolith goes down, there's a big impact. But when a service goes down, there's less impact. So that kind of architecture is more uh, balanced and made for a continuous de deployment um, mode of work. Work on a minimal viable product approach, you know, MVP. It's good because it allows you to focus your attention on getting the most bare minimal done to get a feature out deployed 
and then start getting feedback from the field on whether it hits the mark of what was expected from it, whether you can evolve it further, and where there's scope for improvement. What you don't want to do is go build an Eiffel Tower and figure out that your customers didn't ne really need an Eiffel Tower. They just needed the Seattle needle. And it would be too expensive then to go back and fix it. Um, the other practice is never roll back. You know, this, in this mode of work where we're talking about constantly releasing and deploying stuff, we can't have a rollback condition. Rollbacks don't work. In a mode of continuous deployment, you are immutable in your delivery. You have to fix it, and the process needs to be quick enough to allow the fixes to roll out uh, as soon as they're ready. Um, you cannot be successful with continuous deployment unless you have a way of measuring things that are happening in production in the live site. And that's where things like operation insights, app insights, telemetry, diagnostics are really, really useful. And you know, with more of cloud platforms taking on this, uh, this role, you would see they have native tools available that give you the high level and the drill down view of telemetry, operations insights, application insights. And then they allow eventing for when things happen, for things to happen, which means if infra infrastructure is damaged, self-heal, go restart, go do this, go run this script, which kind of helps you have the first level of checks and balances in place even before the issue gets to you. And you kind of need that if you want to move into a continuous deployment mode. Metrics, you know, have you ever had that conversation with uh, someone who says, oh, we want to track what, what is the velocity of your team? And you're like, how does that help you in any way? What you should be measuring is a product level KPI. How many uh, customers are moving on to the new version of the platform that we've rolled out? You know, how many customers are buying the new features that we're developing? How many customers are becoming free to uh, pro? You know, these are the kind of metrics you're interested in. And when you start measuring those business metrics in IT, then it becomes a view of let's join up to deliver a product rather than let's join up to deliver a part of technology. And organizations that go full continuous deployment move away from just you know, these mundane uh, technology-centric KPIs to more business-focused KPIs. But it's a cultural shift, one that takes time to adapt. Um, so let's get to the techniques of, um, of um, um, continuous uh, deployment. The first technique I want to call out here is feature flags, one that we will cover in a demo as well. Feature flags are amazing. You know, if you want to be continuously deploying stuff in production, you can't have this condition where, uh, oh, I'm going to take a week to, uh, to create this stuff, so I'm not going to do a deployment for a week. Let me just add some plumbing, uh, some server level uh, APIs, and let's just hide that behind a condition and roll that code out into production. And then let me behind the scenes enable that feature just for myself so I can keep invoking that API with production data to see whether it's resilient, whether it's giving me the responses I need, whether it's going to be able to scale. Uh, and likewise, you know, when we develop new features in an application, we will only want to roll it out to a fair few to get feedback. We don't want to have to like set up a test instance and invite them because the, the chances of that happening are quite low. But when you release in production and they say, look, you know, we've just released this new feature, it's private, can you go and test it for me, give me feedback, chances of that happening are high. But all of that works on the principle of feature flags. And we'll, we'll look at a couple of extensions that enable that. We'll work through that in a demo. The next uh, one here is blue-green deployments. You know, it's a good practice to have production-like environments available uh, where, you can, um, where you can roll out stuff. So as it says here, blue-green is a technique for deployments where the existing running deployment is left in place, a new version of the application is installed, and then a flip and a switchover happens. So if you're working in, in uh, microservices or if you're using uh, Azure Service Fabric or any of those service fabric-oriented technologies, then you would see it's very, very easy to spin up a new host uh, of um, your service, which has a new version of the software, direct the traffic to it, and then flip it over when you're kind of ready to roll it out. And uh, that, that's a very popular topic uh, and an approach that's available within Azure through Service Fabric, through Web App, in, in the form of slots. Uh, the other uh, uh, technique that's available is canary, canary releases. And this is one that we'll look at in a demo, which basically means you do a phase deployment where you patch a few servers first, uh, you know, adjust your load balancer such that some traffic gets routed out to it, and then you can gauge whether it's working fine. And if it's all working fine, then you just roll that release out to all the other environments. Um, the, the last one in the list is uh, DevSecOps. Uh, and you know, I'm calling it out for a reason here. It's because as we all move to this DevOps way of working, 
we actually forgot that there is another department in the organization called security. And unless you take them in the fold, you'll still have a siloed organization because trust me, the cost of a data breach today is higher than ever before. There is the financial cost, but then there is the cost of reputation, right? So if, if you are an organization that is holding customer data and that customer data gets leaked, then the amount of shame that brings to the brand is, is just, is just un, un, um, fixable in a way. And not having security on board means you're exposing yourself, but having security on board means you kind of have to wait for their manual processes to be complete. And they might not be as swift and, and as quick in their uh, validations as you may be in your dev and, and operations rollout. But having some sort of an automated way where you can take them in the fold in your own pipelines, automate part of what security does means you can actually roll out a release with confidence knowing that it's, it's yes, automated, but it's secure at the same time. This, uh, in this video, we're gonna have a, a quick run through of feature flag functionality. We'll look at an open source framework that's available that we can just grab from NuGet that has all the functionality that you need to get started with feature flags. Um, I've also used uh, of late uh, this uh, product called Launch Darkly. Launch Darkly is a commercial product for which there is an extension available on Visual Studio Team Services Marketplace. I must say it's a pretty impressive uh, tool set that they offer. You have a central cocktail, uh, cockpit from where you can run your A-B experiments, you know, your uh, canary deployments. You can get uh, like feedback on how the deployment rolled out, you know, what percentage of traffic is going there, what's the pulse like. You could enable disable features. You could tie in features into packages and kind of control them. So pretty impressive. Um, but the reason I'm not covering that in a demo is because they have about 20, 30 product videos on their website as well. Um, which go into a lot of detail as to how you can set up and get started with Launch Darkly. Uh, if you are doing, um, if you are planning to use feature flags extensively, then I would encourage you to go and have a look at that extension. In this specific video, we're going to talk about the open source solution that's out there. Maybe not that well, um, you know, talked about. So uh, let's get started with it. Okay, so let's flip right into a demo. Okay, so you know, if you were gonna Google for uh, feature flags, you will find this um, quite a popular page, uh, and I must say an unbiased page, which, uh, which talks about uh, plenty of open source and paid products that are out there that kind of help you accomplish um, feature flagging and, and launching darkly and you know, feature flip, feature switch. It's just the same thing, but a lot of acronyms for it. Um, uh, we just briefly mentioned Launch Darkly. Um, pretty impressive, you should go and check it out. The one that I'm planning to cover for this video is the one from Jason Roberts. Uh, if we click here, it takes us to his uh, open source uh, repo and then there's there's a fair about amount of documentation that he has uh, around this. There's a plural side video as well, so uh, which covers um, the concept in a lot more detail. So uh, what I'm gonna do now is to show you how we can put this in practice. I will mimic what we usually do when we're about to work on a new feature. So in this case, I am working on the submit code base and I wanna add a new page in there for location. And I've kind of gotten started with it, but I'm finding it hard to test it on my dev machine because um, I'm unable to use the API that I need and I'm unable to put the mileage behind it because I'm always only gonna have my IP address. So I can't really test the API a lot. So what I wanna do is I wanna put this out in production, but I wanna have most of it disabled so no one can get to this page. So typically I would go in a controller, you know, create a class, maybe create some other methods that I comment out an entry path to so no one can, can get to it. But by commenting stuff out, I'm introducing technical debt here because someone else who looks at this code base, this is gonna make no sense to them. You know, Why do we have commented out code? In SonarCube and NDepend, this is gonna show up uh, as an incorrect metric as well. If we go in the view section, what I've done here is I've created a, uh, a page for location so that there is an entry point to it, but I've commented it out so no one can get to it. And then I've created a view, location CS, but then I'm not publishing any of the properties on that page because I've, I've commented out the business logic, I don't have any properties to render, 
So I'm just going to simply show a message here saying coming soon. So let's run this app up and see what the behavior looks like at the moment. This is what your user would see, right? They wouldn't have an access to the location, but somehow if they have the URL and they went there, they'll see coming soon. Not very nice, and especially not very nice if you are a public facing company. So let's close this and see how we can use feature flags to use to actually have the feature live, but hidden behind the feature flag, so no code commenting. The benefit also here is that there's type safety. So if someone was gonna go and uh, do something in terms of uh, remove the feature flag, then you're gonna start having compile time exceptions and runtime. So not only runtime exceptions, but compile time exceptions. The benefit is, you know, when you put if else conditions in your code to say, if my config file value says, uh, don't enter this code, or if I set something as false, don't try and traverse through this code base, if someone goes and removes the app key from the config file, you're not gonna have compile time issues, which means your tests aren't gonna fail, you're simply gonna ship it, and when it runs in production, it's not gonna find that config value and it will start failing. So with this framework that I'm about to show you, when you remove stuff accidentally or on purpose, it starts to fail the build in compile mode and points you where it's failing so you can go and fix it there rather than having problems during the run and execution in production. So um, let's right click on the web project, go into NuGet, and let's look in for feature flags. Now you can see feature flags is quite a popular search word, but the, the one that we need is feature toggles. So feature toggle. Now feature toggle core is the one that we're after. By the number of downloads, you can see it's quite a popular framework. It's just installing it at the moment. When I say installing, it's just adding a reference to it to the project. Okay, so let me remove some of the package feeds that I'm not using. Okay, so feature toggle, let's, uh, let's go back uh, to it and Search for it again. So there's feature flag uh, core. There is, uh, let's install this as well. Okay, let's try this one. Let me cancel that and uh, remove the pre-release flag from there and just install the ones that I actually need. Okay, so that's installed core and toggle both are installed. That's the one we need. So. Uh, with that set up, let's close this window and uh, go back into our code. Now to start using it, the first thing I need to do is I need to go and create a new folder. And uh, let's call this folder toggle. Now, uh, because I wanna hide the, the functionality for location, let's go and create a new class and call it geolocation toggle.cs. Now, if we go and check out the documentation for uh, this, um, now we can see that it tells you which packages you need to install and um, it tells you how you can get started. So when you add a new feature, a new toggle, you need to inherit from one of the classes that the package exposes. Now the class that you inherit from uh, is entirely dependent on which type of toggle you wanna put in place. The, the toggles that are in place with this package are you know, always on, always off. Um, then there's a, toggle, uh, there's a toggle which would look at the value that you specify in order to be enabled or disabled. Then there are date-based toggles. So you could say only enable this feature after this date or don't enable this feature or switch this feature off after this date. And then there's a toggle for between dates as well and then there is a toggle for database as well, which means you could actually specify a table in your database wherein you can centrally manage the toggles and you can provide it uh, the connection string to the database and a select query that it can run to get the value that it needs. So the one that I'm gonna create now is for, let's start off by creating um, feature toggle for
Let's use the simple feature toggle here. So let's do this. I'm going to have to add a reference to this. So with that reference added, now I can go back into my home controller. And instead of commenting out code, I could do the following. I could say toggle is equal to new geolocation toggle. Might just need to add a reference to it. And then all I will say here is toggle dot feature enabled. So what I can th then, then do here is I can say if, if this value is true, then go within this. If not, then just don't go within this. So it's probably worth moving some of uh, this logic in here as well. Now I've added a, a function here that actually does the heavy lifting of calling the API uh, that I, I need to parse uh, the IP address of the user into a location. I'm using a, a freely available API called ipapi.com and I want the output to be JSON, so I'm gonna pass it my IP address. It will invoke the API and then give me a result set. So what I've done is I've, I've hidden the call to this API behind the feature flag, which means if the feature flag is set to off, then no one can get to it, but optionally I can set it to on uh, for my specific user profile and invoke this even after launching this in production, no one else would be able to get to it. So this is me putting a feature flag on a feature that's uh, on the server side. Now if I wanted to do this on the client side, I could follow the same steps. I could go into my location, see a HTML file, and I could add some logic here to say, toggle is equal to new uh, geo location toggle. And again, I might, I might need to add a reference to it. So the reference would be, let's copy this. There we go. And then I could do the same thing here. If Okay, so I've done the same thing here. I'm saying, you know, when it's when it's turned off, disable it from the UI as well, so no one can actually see these properties. And I could decide to put the whole thing under the feature flag if I wanted to as well. Now that the the coding for this has been done, you have to specify the configuration. In this case, we have to go back into the web config file, and then within the web config file, we have to create a new app setting. The syntax that you need to use is following. It is a feature toggle, which is the name of the library, dot the name of the class that you're setting the toggle for, and then a value of true or false. So let's set this to true to begin with, and let's run our code. All right, so uh, it was a minor issue. I'd forgotten to put in uh, the pass the value of the model through to uh, the view, and that's why I was getting, getting a null exception. So in order to show this in action, I'll go into the layout CS and uncomment the location. Now if I run this up, you can see that uh, the location shows up because in the config file, we've decided to enable this setting. So let me come into Visual Studio and let's actually see the full experience. Let's go into location. 
you can see that the API is being invoked. Uh, because I'm running this locally, it's taking one as the IP address, and so the status that comes back for the geolocation is fail, because the API will only succeed when there is a proper IP address assigned to it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go into Solution Explorer, go into the web config file, and here, instead of having this as true, I'm going to change this as false. Let's see if I go and refresh this, what happens? Oh, okay, I might need to run this up again. Now, as you can see, um, I'm back on the screen, and if, uh, if I look at the menu, I still have location showing up, but the, the data set is, uh, is uh, not showing up anymore. Um, so what's effectively happening is uh, I'm, I still have the link on the page left, so let me put in the logic there to hide the link as well. So let's stop this in debug. Let's go back into the layout.cs file, and let's add the logic in here as well. So we'll do that by Having a section here where toggle is equal to new geolocation toggle. Let's get the full namespace from here. Okay, that's interesting. Let's go back into the location. Let's take this. All right. And with that, let's just put the condition here to say if toggle Okay, with that done, let's uh, launch this in let's launch this uh. Okay, as you can see now, if we go back in here, the location link is gone. And if I try and browse to the location link directly, then I'm able to get to the page, but I don't see any of the data set there. So if I go back into the location page, uh, I've got the feature flag at this level. It might be worth moving the feature lab, uh, flag a level up. So what we can do here is let's refresh this page now. And you can see that even that text is gone. So brilliant, right? I mean, you're able to manage from within configuration what parts of your application are being exposed to the users, what parts of the application are hidden because uh, you've protected them behind a, a feature flag. Now, this was a very basic example, but uh, you know, where I've seen this applied a lot is when marketing wants to launch a campaign and uh, you know, they want to have the campaign, uh, the functionality for the campaign rolled out a week or two ahead of the campaign so that it can be invoked and tested. And then at the time of the rollout, you don't need to actually organize a release. You know, back in the days when Black Friday sale was, uh, was about to happen, IT systems would go down because someone tried to do a release and the release failed. And on the day when they're expecting to do a lot of sale, they don't have the system online. But with feature flags, especially the ones where you could uh, put the feature behind a date, a specific flag, you could actually roll out the feature, if not months, weeks in advance, and then on the day, at the specified time, the, the URL becomes active and the users can access it, and for the rest of the time, it's inactive, it's inavailable, and there's no way to get to it except for when you want to get to it yourself. So in a nice and easy way to continuously deploy stuff hidden behind a feature flag, the thing to be careful with feature flags is because you're adding a lot of you know, conditional logic within your code to show and hide stuff, if you don't have some kind of a practice in place to, to remove these uh, toggles um, when you have actually released this functionality, then you're going to start to accumulate technical debt. So it's best practice to kind of have a process in place where you can hide stuff behind feature toggles, but when that functionality is released, that you go in into the code and clean uh, the toggles that don't need to be there. But pretty exciting feature nevertheless. So I would, I would encourage you to go check out feature flags and um, uh, you know, leave a comment for Jason on his GitHub page if you like his uh, open source uh, uh, extension. The new DevOps is DevSecOps. As we talked about this previously, you can't really leave security out of your DevOps um, 
workflow because at the end of the day, the cost of having a data breach is significantly high, but at the same time, the overhead that security adds in your delivery process can be tremendous. So, uh, you know, why not work with them to automate the checks and balances that they perform as a, as a security operation and bring that left into the, the life cycle of development, testing, like you've done with your build and release pipelines. In this video, we're gonna, we're gonna look at what it means to bring security into the loop, and we'll look at one of the extensions called uh, White Source um, that is available in the Visual Studio Team Services Marketplace that you can put to work um, that gives you uh, the ability to kind of uh, have security checks done as part of your uh, build and release pipeline. So as this, as this uh, slide depicts, the cost of fixing issues that are related to security are significantly higher as you move from the, the you know, coding to build to, to QA and then into production. Now, of course, when there's a security breach in production, um, you know, fixing it means you kind of need to address it in your dev environments and then test it all the way through. And you might not have all the relevant infrastructure to create those scenarios that you may have in production. So it just becomes harder and more difficult to address these scenarios. Uh, and what are those some of, uh, you know, what are the, some of the common scenarios that you would want to check from a security point of view? The first thing you would want to check is you're taking dependency on open source, right? So uh, a lot of the times when we need um, some sort of uh, a package that does something, we go and look it up on NuGet or we go and look it up on Google and then we simply download it and attach it to our project without thinking whether there might be some malware scripts in that package. You know, we don't do a, a good enough job to go and investigate whether the package is clean or it's got some code that might be sniffing some of the content from our code base and pushing it out into the developer's, um, you know, data collection as they might have set it up. So, for example, if you are, uh, uh, you know, writing some code for a bank and you take a dependency on a package which behind the scene is publishing credit card information out, then you're in a bit of a trouble. So wouldn't it be great if there was a way to um, check whether a package has been scanned and, and has a quality standard associated to it? Luckily, there are providers out there that have a, a, a database of uh, you know, um, quality against packages, uh, licenses against packages, and you know, you're basically paying to access that database. Now, when you run this as part of your pipeline, it will make a call out to that database provided by that company to validate whether the package that you're taking dependency on uh, is, is categorized under any of the threats. And if not, uh, you know, then you're good to use it. The other value adds that come from this is if you're using a package that is out of date, but you haven't realized that newer versions of that package have been released, then you might be onboarding some legacy uh, debt here. And it's worth having a process that can identify when packages are out of date and, and inform you so that you can go ahead and do the updates as and when you find necessary. So um, let's flip right into the demo where we'll uh, walk through quickly this extension and see it in action. So as you can see, I'm in Visual Studio Team Services and I'm in a, a build here, that uh, build pipeline. And within this pipeline, I've added two extensions called White Source Bolt and White Source. Uh, you wouldn't have these pre-installed on your uh, VSTS instance, but you can get to them by going into the marketplace and searching for White Source. And there they are. Like, uh, you know, effectively free um, for a trial period, and one of them is free. You just have to sign up on the vendor website. Uh, but you can read because um, the licensing conditions keep changing. Um, so having installed it, I've added it to my pipeline here, and I don't need to do any specific configuration. I just need to have it some point uh, in my pipeline so that uh, it's uh, after the NuGet package restores so that it can get the packages that it needs to go and identify whether there is, uh, they're in that thread database or not. And in the full product called White Source, there is an alerting mechanism as well. You just need to go and register on the vendor website where it creates a dashboard for you and then sends you alerts rather than you having to go to ch check the dashboard. It tells you that a certain package might be going out of date, notifying you that when you have time, go and update it. So let's, uh, let's trigger this. I'll run this on the hosted agent. 
While this is working, I've already uh, ran a sample of this and created the report. Let me just walk you through the report. So as you can see from the, the previous build that I've run here, once the build is successful, I see an option here saying white source bold uh, build report. And I just need to navigate to uh, this section here, white source bold. And as you can see here, I can see the build definition this was run for. I can see when it was last scanned. Um, and it's giving me an overall uh, you know, red-green rating to say how secure or vulnerable my, my repository here is. On top of that, it's giving me a breakdown of the severity-based um, uh, distribution uh, of the problem. So for example, if I see here, it's saying, I have, um, I have the following packages, and they have seven separate licensings on them. Like some of them are, you know, Apache 2.0. This is pretty much open source. So there are some packages that are licensed to Microsoft. So I need to be aware that I use them under the correct license provision rather than, you know, freely sharing them. But it's highlighting that here. Then the, then the other thing you see is some of these packages that I've taken dependency on don't have any license distribution assigned to them. So they might be ones worth looking at. Uh, at the bottom here, it's telling me outdated uh, libraries. So if I click show, I can see specifically which libraries I am taking a dependency on which have already gone out of date. For example, this one here, the version that I'm referencing is from 2013. Well, that's pretty old. Considering that there is a new version available, I should really think about upgrading the version that I have. And you know, unless you have some kind of a mechanism that does a thorough scan like this every time you commit code, um, chances are you're never going to get to this information. I mean. Uh, the, the, the security teams don't have a microscope to sit down and scan every line of code that you write. Well, they can't scan every line of code in every branch, in every project, in every repository, right? And if you're a bigger distributed organization, then doing a validation only gets difficult. So without bringing security into the fold, it's only going to be harder to ensure that your products are fully security compliant. And I think starting off by checking the, the open source licensing the open source dependencies uh, is a good start. And also it enables you to upgrade your packages when newer versions are available. So uh, go check out white source and um, put, put, put their extension in your, in your build pipeline and try it out. Kind of feels that we've covered the ability to uh, deploy continuously. Now we need to be in a position where we can gauge what's happening in production, right? We've deployed some code. We want to know what the trends are. We want to know what the diagnostics looks like. What we want to know how the users are interacting with our app. But there's no end to how much data we can harness back from production. We just need the right framework, which will allow us to slice and dice the data, which will give us the ability to put that data to work, integrate with other frameworks. And App Insights kind of ticks all the boxes there. Um, so in this video, what we'll do is we'll have a quick walkthrough of how you can, uh, you can use App Insights within your continuous integration, continuous delivery, and continuous deployment processes to harness some intelligence back from uh, pretty much any environment, uh, production, non-production, test, uh, and then put that insight to work for you, for your product, for your product teams. Now, there's a, there's a course on EDX library which will cover uh, application insights in far more de detail than I'm going to go into. So I'd encourage you to go and check it out. Uh, so let's right, get into a demo here. OK, so what I've done is uh, for the web app uh, that we, we had created, I've set up a new uh, app insights um, um, resource type, and I've added it uh, and configured it to work with that web app. Now, this is quite well documented on the App Insights portal, and it's quite well covered in the other course that I referred to. But just to give you a feel for if you haven't tried App Insights yet, is as your app gets utilized or invoked, then it sends this data out that App Insights can gather, and then it can surface that information into metrics that you can slice and dice for your own convenience. I mean, things that you can get right away without having to put any configuration is in place is things like you know, server response time, page load time, server request, fail request, time spent on a page, so on and so forth. But what I've done in this case is I've customized App Insights for one specific thing. Now, in one of the previous videos, we talked about uh, toggles, feature toggles. 
And so we talked, people have this tendency to put feature toggles in, but once the feature is released, they don't really tend to go back in and remove the feature toggles. Wouldn't it be great if we could leverage App Insights to actually figure out what uh, toggles are still hanging out in our code base and then report that data back into App Insights so that we can then use that data, set up some alerting on it, and then action it when we need to. So just to show you how I've done it, if I go back into the code base, what I've done is in the, um, in the toggle folder where we have a lot of the toggles defined, I've added a logger, uh, a reference to a logger class that I've created. Now this toggle telemetry logger class uh, just gets some information back from the toggle. So anyone who is implementing a toggle needs to uh, implement this logger class, which will publish the name of the, the toggle, its type, and uh, you know, its current status uh, back into the logger class. And in the logger class, I'm using the App Insights SDK that's freely available. It's available for all platforms and all languages, so you should definitely check it out, whether you're doing PHP, Java, Node, whatever. And then I'm basically capturing this data, and then I'm publishing an event back to App Insights to say, look, I've just got data about the logger, uh, the, 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 the toggle, and this is the information I've received, and I'm publishing this as an event and as a metric. Now, if I go back into App Insights, and I go into the Metric Explorer, what you would see is I have, a, I have the ability to configure how I can consume this data. So I've set up some charts here, and let me just click Edit to show you the chart that I've set up here. I'm saying show me a bar chart uh, by aggregation, so count, and then group this by operation name, so what, uh, what, kind of, what page is this coming from. Uh, because this is an MV, MVC app, I can see this is coming from home, index, um, and then bring me back the count of toggles. Now, because I'm, uh, I'm using toggle as a metric and, and as an event, I can both group by and aggregate on it. So I can see here that we have uh, about 24 calls being made to this active toggle. Now, if I scroll down further, I can see how many calls to this toggle were made in a specific session. And if I scroll down further, I'm able to see which of the toggles was called how many times. Like the spring promotions toggle that I've set up here was called 24 times. Now, if a toggle shouldn't be there because you've released that functionality and it's continuing to be used here, you're putting App Insights to work to harness that information and intelligence back from your code base. Of course, you can go and pay for a product like LaunchDarkly or one of the other ones out there that provide the, the, the dashboard capability natively, but by being able to leverage App Insights, you're able to harness that information and put it to work for you. What more, you can actually drill down further and then start to create dashboards that will tell you, uh, you know, what are the types of toggles you have. So you, you know the toggle classes you have, but what type are they? Are they database type? Are they always enabled, always disabled? You can kind of get that information back as well. And I'm here getting a, a count of the events back as well. So if I'm expecting that a certain functionality has been released, and for it, the toggle should not exist anymore. And seeing this data here, I'm like suspicious. What's going on? I need to go and fix it. So a lot of the times, it's, it's the ignorance of not having the data handy that legacy starts to come in in your code. But by leveraging the smart tools like App Insights and some of the other modern engineering platforms that we've talked about, uh, you can really, really make a difference. One other thing worth highlighting here is if I go back into my release pipeline, there is an extension available called um, App Insights release annotation. You can import this extension within your release pipelines, and every time you trigger a release, it will actually take the metadata of your release uh, and then publish that to the App Insights ID that you specify here. Of course, you need to generate an API key, and you can do that by going into App Insights uh, from the left setting section, look for API access, generate a key, you've got the application ID here, just plug it in and run your build definition or the release definition, and that data gets published across. So I'll quickly show you how that experience looks like. So if I go back into the, the App Insights here, and I launch uh, this chart here, and let me customize the time range to last 30 days, update. Now you can see, you see this little marker here calling out that uh, a release was done, and it tells me the number of the release and when it was done. Now, I can actually see that the, there was a spike in traffic after this, but even though there was a spike in traffic, the server response time has gone significantly higher, which could allude to 
a change that might have accidentally been shipped out in production or a new deployment that we would have done which might have introduced some new functionality which is causing this spike. But having this marker here is, is a good indication that something changed. And, it, and then if you click on it, you get further details on what version of the app was shipped, you know, and a, a link back to the actual build and release definition. So it makes the investigation process a lot easier in that case. So uh, with that, uh, you know, we are kind of uh, at a place where we can summarize the journey that we've made. Um, you know, we went uh, all the way from creating a, a simple CI build, automating that build, maturing that with uh, release management by automating the infrastructure, the deployment, the functional testing, the performance testing, the configuration tokenization. We took it a step further by uh, you know, deploying in a phased manner with uh, group deployments. And then we took that a step further by introducing feature flags. Um, and then from feature flags, we looked at how we can take it even a step further and get telemetry back from production and put that intelligence to work to further enhance our project. Our product. So that's it. Uh, signing off. Hope you enjoyed the course. Uh, do be uh, feel free to leave us feedback. Uh, keep in contact on Twitter. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions or comments about the course.